Well, the elections are Tuesday. And then Thanksgiving will soon be upon us. And after this comes Christmas and then New Year's and all the resolutions that we're going to make for 2019. Imagine New Year's only 58 days from now. Ooh, sorry I reminded you. Have you ever noticed uh, that most New Year's resolutions have to do with our mouths? You ever think about that? It has to do with our mouths. I mean, I, I've never heard someone say, this year I'm going to take better care of my toes. Somehow. Or this year I plan to clean up my ears more often. Could be a good thing, but I don't hear people say that very often. Now for most people, resolutions have to do with what goes into their mouths or promises to regulate what comes out of their mouths. Since the time for resolutions is only a few weeks away, I want to talk about the traffic that comes in and out of our mouths and how we might be able to keep some of those promises that we make to ourselves each year about what goes in our mouth and what comes out of our mouths. Well, let's talk about the, um, let's see, there we go. Let's talk about the in traffic first, shall we? In traffic first because between Thanksgiving and Super Bowl Sunday, there sure is a lot of traffic going in to our mouths. Of course, I'm talking about the food and drink type of traffic into our mouths. When it comes to food intake, we could say that in America, we're in a constant traffic jam. Surveys show that Americans are the most overweight people in the world. I don't know if that we should be striving for that goal, but we are there. Our national obsession is weight loss with a multi-billion dollar diet and exercise industry operating in this country. The, iron, the, the irony of it, however, is that there is also a multi-billion dollar junk food and fast food industry in this country as well. I, I don't know if the, each corporations buy shares in each other, you know what I'm saying? But they keep each other alive. In addition to this, we live in a society where food is cheap and accessible 24 hours a day. It's available on every street corner. It's relentlessly advertised. We're constantly stimulated and provoked to eat at all times. Even in the church, I hate to say this, 90% of our activities involve food. I said, hey, this weekend we're having a big old, we're going out to the park and we're going to have a fast. I, I think I'd be by myself, you know. I, <laughs> what, no food? It's interesting that the main problem with children in our country is to force them to eat all of their food. And the main problem with adults is that a large number of diseases and ill health can be traced to either overeating or eating the wrong kinds of food. I mean, I'm saying it in a humorous way, but I know I'm meddling here, I know it. This is God's joke on all of us. This was supposed to be the evening service. Some of you just showed up on the wrong Sunday, that's all. <laughs> We don't like to hear sermons on self-control, especially when it comes to our intake of food. The Bible treats the subject of food as a, a basic need of man, as well as a, a blessing, like all other needs and blessings that come from God. He expects us to be good stewards of the food that we receive from Him. The mention of food is seen throughout the Bible you know, God designed man to eat food. He could have designed us 
where simply by breathing, we were taking in all the necessary nutrients that we needed. We never had to eat you know, food, prepare food. We could just breathe. But he didn't do that, did he? He designed us as individuals that need to eat food. We need that intake to, to survive physically. And of course, God has always provided for all the creatures, including mankind, the food that he needs and that all creatures need every day. Doesn't the psalmist say in 136, 25, God who gives food to all flesh? He does so in natural and supernatural ways as we see while the Jews, for example, were in the desert. He fed them miraculously with manna from heaven. This not only shows God's power, but also His concern for man's basic need. We have to eat. He's made it this way. God is the one who provides the food, regardless of how it is grown or processed or cooked. In the end, He is the one who supplies all the elements to make this possible. And God provides for us on a daily basis the food that we need. Each day, God will guarantee we have enough to eat. We see this principle as He feeds His people one day at a time when they were in the desert. Remember the story? They weren't allowed to collect two days worth of food, two days worth of manna, one day at a time. Those who tried to collect more than one day, that food were, you know, rotted. And then when they were told not to collect food on the Sabbath, the day before, they collected enough for that day. God provides exactly what we need. And we see Jesus confirming this idea when He says what in His prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Repeats it twice. Give us today the bread that we need today. And then of course, at times, God prohibited the eating of certain kinds of food to um, identify and separate his chosen people from the pagan nations around them. We read about that in Leviticus chapter one, or chapter 11 rather, and following. Of course, the point was not that eating or not eating certain foods made them special or holy because of what they ate or didn't eat. It was the fact that they obeyed God in this matter that made them special. Jesus declared that all food was permitted with His coming since the determining factor that made a person holy would now be faith in Him as the Messiah and no longer obedience to food laws. Read about that in 1 Timothy 4. And Paul taught the first century Christians to be patient with those who had trouble letting go of food restrictions and not force them to give, give these things up if they couldn't do it in good conscience, 1 Corinthians 8. And so I, I've gone over, over all of this because the subject of food and its use is a subject that is found from the beginning of the Old Testament right through the New Testament as well. It's not as if you know, God invented food and then just left us alone to figure it all out. No, there's a lot of teaching about food and its various uses in the Bible. Now God also provides the guidelines to enable us to use the food that He gives us without sinning. And these break down into three rather simple principles. Number one, eat a reasonable amount. Proverbs, the writer says, keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. And so the writer asks God to provide him with, not what, uh, with um, uh, what he needs in both wealth and food. Not too much that he forget God, become worldly, and not too little that he curse God. Just the right amount. Now the word glutton in the Bible refers to a person who is, and here's the interesting part, who is a careless eater, a careless eater, a devourer, one who eats everything in sight. 
The nickname in the Bible was slow belly for the glutton. When you dismantle most diet plans, the basic idea is usually to eat in moderation and be selective, avoiding those things that are known to be harmful. Food is a, is a need and it's a blessing, but God instructs us to be reasonable in our consumption. Even if our conscience won't warn us, our bodies will always let us know when we're being unreasonable about the food that we eat. So a pretty simple idea, eat a reasonable amount. Rule number two, don't let your appetites be your God. Philippians 3 said, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. And so in the book of Philippians, Paul talks of those whose only desire in life is to satisfy their appetites. Whether it be for food or sex or power or pleasure, this is all that counts, just satisfying what they want. What we taste, how often we're satisfied, how we look or not look as a result is for some people the center of their universe, the goal of their existence, to have muscle, to be thin, to have a flat stomach. Man, there are people that put in a whole lot of work to have a flat stomach, but their nose is never in the Bible. To have a clear conscience. Believe me, I'd rather have a clear conscience than a flat stomach. Food is for the belly only, but God's people need to pay attention to spiritual food as much as natural food if they wish to please God and avoid idolatry. Don't make food and its effect on you your God. Another principle about the in traffic. Don't eat and let others starve. Amos, Old Testament prophet, presents an indictment against the Jews who were enjoying many luxuries while others around them were suffering and starving. In Amos chapter six, verse four, he says, those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp and like David have composed songs for themselves who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles and the sprawlers banqueting will pass away. They were having the high life while their brothers were starving and in, in trouble. If God condemns the USA for anything, It'll probably be because we feasted while so many in the world starved to death. God provides the food, but He leaves to man the matter of distribution and sharing. Many times the West has manipulated supplies to keep the price high, but in doing so millions starve. And we ask our farmers many times to store their crops because they have too much. Each of us who eats, has a responsibility in some way to provide for those who don't eat. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may, there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. God provides for us so we can provide for others. Now, of course, we personally can't feed the world, but as Christians, the proper use of our food is to share what we have in some way. So let's summarize this in traffic portion here, shall we? This year, as we examine our intake of food, and make all sorts of promises about losing weight or getting our blood pressure down, let's remember God's teaching about food intake. Be reasonable. A steady, moderate approach is always the best and longest lasting way to consume food. And also vary your diet. Don't just focus on physical food, 
try to cultivate a taste for spiritual food as well. For example, if you've ever noticed on those white cars, there's a little thing at the top that says RBR. If you don't know what that means, that's regular Bible reader. That means, do you read your Bible three days out of seven? Do you find the time at least three times a week to just sit down and read a chapter or two of, of the word and think about that, maybe offer a prayer of thanksgiving or reflection? It doesn't have to be two hours long, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Are you able to find, are you able to carve out that little time at least three times a week? Then if you are, RBR, you're a regular Bible reader, just put a check in that. I've noticed over the years, never get more than 60 people. We're 400 here. Okay, let's take away the little kids, you know, the very little ones that can't read. So let's say we're 300. We're 60. 60 people out of 300 find the time to read their Bible three times a week. That's intake. And then of course, share what you have. You can show God your gratitude for a full belly by trying to get some food into somebody else's belly. Basic guidelines which will help us be thankful and sober-minded about what goes into our own mouths. All right, let's talk about the out traffic, shall we? The out traffic. So much for incoming. Let's look at outgoing traffic, the things we say with our mouths. We can sin with incoming traffic in you know, three basic ways. Too much intake, too focused on intake, too selfish with intake. The ways we can sin with outgoing traffic, however, are more numerous and more damaging. With intake, we only hurt ourselves. With outtake or outgoing sins, we can hurt everybody. Now this is not an exhaustive list I have here, but some of the sins of the tongue are uh, blasphemy, vulgarity, dishonesty, boasting, unkindness, criticism, unwarranted criticism, jealousy, slander, gossip, provocation, swearing. I mean, we could go on and on. Usually our resolutions about outgoing mouth traffic says, I'm not going to blaspheme, I'm not going to gossip, I'm not going to tell any bad joke, I'm not going to be vulgar, I'm going to stop saying the F word when I'm mad. You know, it's, those are our resolutions. And these are the hardest resolutions to keep because it seems that no sooner do we make this commitment, we watch and hear our own mouths doing exactly what we said we wouldn't do. Young moms are saying, I am not going to scream today. I am not going to scream and take out my frustration on these children. Today's a new day. Lord, you're going to help me. I mean the breakfast cereal has not even been spilled on the floor yet and she's already screaming at the kid. You know, it's like, why, how, how did I get there? It's like our mouths have a mind of their own and our spirit is listening to our mouths saying words while our hearts are secretly saying, okay, well next time I'm going to do better and, and we leave our mouth to keep going. That the outgoing traffic is hard to control and nearly impossible to stop is recognized by God. What does James say? But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. The task seems hopeless because James said, no one can tame the tongue. Yes, no man, no woman can do it, but with God all things are possible. So if this is your resolution, outgoing traffic, here are some instructions that God provides in the quest for controlling the outgoing traffic of our mouths. Number one, ask God to be the traffic cop of your mouth. Psalm 141, the psalmist says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, keep watch over the door of my lips. Seems that the outgoing traffic was a problem a long time ago. You know, many times we accept Jesus as our Lord and we make Him Lord of our time and Lord of our priorities, but not of what we say. Our mouths are the last bastion of our freedom and independence. We can think what we want, we can say what we think whenever and to whoever we want. It's the last thing to die. 
the last thing to be submitted to the Lord. Asking the Lord to watch our hearts where our thoughts originate and our mouths where they find expression and freedom is to submit this important part of our lives into the hands of God. If we consciously and persistently do this, the Lord will take over and begin working His Lordship over our lips. He will, this is a prayer that He does answer. Number two, recognize that God will judge us for what we say, not just what we do. Matthew 12, 36, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Again, James says that the tongue is a restless evil and sets a person's life on fire. Think of all the heartache and trouble and suffering caused in families as well as nations on account of words. I, I, I don't even want to get into politics and I know we're voting soon, but have you, have you heard what people have said? Uh, I'm, I'm not selecting a party here. Have you heard what everybody is saying on both sides? I mean the most incredible things, the, the meanest, vilest things that people are saying on, on television, in front of the world. It's terrible, it's, ter it's shameful. It's just a shameful thing. And God hears every word we say. And more importantly, He judges the intention and the character of everything proceeding from our lips. I guarantee you there's a lot to account for in the last year by a lot of people. This realization should make us afraid for what's already passed from our own lips and make us more careful for the future. God's judgment is sure and if no word will escape His notice, we should think seriously about the things that we say and how we say them. And then thirdly, let's use our mouths according to God's purpose and for His glory. Again, the psalmist 51 says, O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. I believe the reason we're given to lies and boasting and foolish talk and blasphemy is because we don't use our lips more often for the purpose for which they were designed. Satan has taken over the control of our lips. You know, in the Catholic Church growing up, I would see monks who took vows of silence and lived in monasteries. A vow of silence means you didn't speak at all. And this vow was made in order to try to solve the mouth problem by not speaking at all. But I believe, with, even though they had a good intention, they missed the point. The mouth isn't bad. It's how it's used that makes it good or bad. If we go through God's word, we see the various uses that God intended for the mouth in speech. A couple of these. The mouth has been created to speak with God in prayer. The mouth has been created to praise God in song. The mouth has been created to teach and correct others. The mouth has been created to communicate with one another. The mouth has been created to praise and honor others. The mouth has been created to express beauty and truth and joy, as well as sorrow in song and, and poetry and stories. The mouth has been created to lift each other up in times of trouble and in times of challenge. These are just a few of the main reasons the ability to speak was given to us by God, but that ability to speak in our day and time has been hijacked and used to destroy one another, to shame one another, to hurt one another. When struggling with sins of the lips, it's not enough just to try to not say anything or the wrong thing. We have to replace these things with the right things to say, the words and the attitudes and the encouragement uh, to others that God has given us lips uh, uh, to, to do. So if your resolution 
involves controlling what comes out of your mouth in 2019, try to remember some of the guidelines that the designer of the mouth gave us to help us succeed. Let God patrol your lips. He will prompt you, he will prompt your conscience and he'll encourage your heart as to the right thing and the right time to speak, because it's not always the right thing, it's also the right time, and God will guide you to the right thing and the right time. Humble yourselves to God's judgment. Realize that you're uh, uh, digging your own grave with your own words. This should motivate you to work on this, and I say you, but I include myself, believe me. And then also, replace unholy with holy. Replace the unholy with holy things. Remember that the goal is not silence. The goal is to honor God and others and ourselves with our lips. Of course, the words that stop traffic in heaven and on earth are spoken when someone comes forward and says the most important words that are ever said. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I want to repent of my sins and my mouth sins and be baptized in his name. You realize that when you become a Christian, you know all those words that you spoke, they stay in the grave of baptism. The only words you're judged on when you come before God are the words of your confession of faith. Those are the only words that God looks at when you come before him in judgment. And then of course, the words, I've been unfaithful as a Christian and I would like to be restored today. Would you please pray for me? When these type words are spoken, angels in heaven, saints on earth, praise God when they hear these things. And so if these words are on the tip of your tongue this morning, then we invite you to come forward now and say them to God and the church as we rejoice and sing our song of encouragement.